All right, so go ahead and open your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 tonight. Since it's uh, almost Christmas, we're going to take a look. We're going to take a look at that stuff because it's fun and I can. So finish this saying for me. If you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. That's right. Well, good night, everyone. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, well, I'm glad you liked it because I got two jokes tonight. That was the one of them. Can you imagine, though, someone not saying anything for 400 years? Because God gave Israel the silent treatment. For 400 years, God didn't tell them anything. And if they had that saying back then, I was like, maybe God doesn't have anything nice to say about us. Because what was the last thing he said? The last thing he said was to Malachi. Or Malachi, if you're Italian. And to Malachi, he, he ended the Old Testament. The Old Testament ends with, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Like, that's the last word they got from God for 400 years. Lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. They might think, oh man, I'm in trouble. And yes, yes, they're in trouble. But then 400 years later, God breaks the silence. He sends Gabriel down into the temple to talk to a special priest, Zacharias. And said, you are going to have a son. He's like, I'm old. My wife is old. How are we going to have, I guess they're southern. Uh, How are we going to have a son? And and he's he's like, well, it's because you didn't believe me, you will not be able to talk until this happens. And he prophesied the birth of John the Baptist. Six months later, the angel Gabriel goes to Mary. We're going to pick it up in verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. Okay, so that is what happened. Six months later, after uh, Gabriel visited Zacharias, he goes to Mary. And Mary's a virgin. That means, you know, she's unmarried, but she's betrothed to a man. In those days, that betrothed, that betrothal was more than our modern engagements, right? Because right now, our modern engagements is the guy, usually, gets down on one knee and says, will you marry me? And she says yes. And then they are engaged for an indeterminate amount of time um, until they actually do the wedding. And if you ask me, I think engagements should be just long enough to plan the wedding. I don't see a reason to drag them out. If you're like, well, I don't know if I want to marry this person, then don't ask if she wants to marry you until you're ready. But when you ask someone to marry you, it's like, okay, the clock's ticking. Because you know what? The, when, I, when I proposed to my wife and she said, well, first she said, ah! And I was like, well, that's not a yes. Then she said yes. It was a happy scream, but I needed the yes. So we got engaged, and then everyone started asking us that night, right away, when are you going to get married? It's like, we don't know. We just got this part done tonight. But everyone said, when are you going to get married? When are you going to get married? And then when you get married, what do they ask you? When are you having kids? That's right. When are you going to start having kids? It's like, can you give us a second? But that's what the expectation is. You get, mar- you get engaged, you get married, have kids. And it is the right order, by the way. Don't do it in a different order. Um, but in that day, you were betrothed sometimes for like your whole life until you get married. Sometimes when you were, when you were born... And your parents were like, it's a girl. What are we going to do with this girl? Let's marry her off. And they go find some family who had a boy, and they say, your son marries my daughter in uh, however many years, when she's old enough. And they're like, okay, and they shake hands on you. You didn't really get much of a say, because that's just the way it worked back then. Was well, it wrong? It's not wrong. It's just different. Um, and and, and so, so she was betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph from the house of David. David, as you know, was the mightiest king in Israel. I bet if you go to Israel today and ask any Jew who's there, who was the best king that Israel ever had, they'd say David. I mean, there's not a whole lot of choices here. I mean, you got Saul, who was kind of like prideful and, 
and, and he, had a, he had a huge head. Um, okay, the Bible doesn't say he had a huge head, but he said he was taller than the, every, every other man from, from the shoulders up, right? So either he had a long neck or a huge head. I'm going with huge head. And so, so, so you had Saul, who kind of did things his own way, got himself in trouble, and then spent 10 years of his life chasing David around the country. You got David, whom God loved, and said, this is a man after my own heart. David, who killed Goliath with a stone, and then cut off his head with Goliath's own sword. We kind of leave that part out of the children's story, right? We're like, oh yeah, he threw a stone at Goliath, Goliath fell down, David won, yeah. It's like, David kind of went up to him, took his sword, and cut his head off. You know, can you imagine this kid lifting this huge head? Look what I got. You know, it's just like, it's, it's, we leave that one out of the coloring books. So, so you got David, and then David starts going, killing Philistines, right? He's, uh, he, he's, he's killing everybody. Like, they sing songs about how Saul killed thousands of Philistines, but David killed tens of thousands of Philistines. When, when David wanted to marry Saul's daughter, because that was the prize for, can you imagine being Michal, Saul's daughter? You have to marry whichever soldier defeats Goliath. It's just like, thanks, Dad, I'm just a prize now. But that's what it is. Whoever wants to marry my daughter is, is the one who feeds, defeats Goliath. And David does it. And David says, I'm here for my prize. And he's like, well, first you got to, like, bring me 100 foreskins. Like, what kind of weird collection is that? What kind of weird request is that? Saul said that because he didn't think David could get it. He thought David would, like, go and be killed getting these foreskins because he's not going to go, like, hey, can I have your foreskin? You know, it's just he's got to kill the guy first. And then David says, you want 100? I'll get you 200. I'm just trying not to imagine the bag that he carries in. And it's like, who's going to count that? You know, Saul's not going to count. He's going to get something that you count it. It's like, I don't want to count it. Okay, and so, so David is this big hero. He leads the army of Israel to victory time and time again. And when he's not leading the, 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 uh, the army to, to, to victory, he's playing his harp. He's making sweet music to the Lord. How wonderful is that? And he's getting himself in trouble with Bathsheba, but we'll just gloss over that right now. David was the best king that Israel ever had. He wasn't the richest. His son Solomon was the richest. His son Solomon was the wisest, although we say he's the wisest, but then what does he do? He does everything God says not to do. He says, do the wrong. He don't collect wives, don't collect gold, don't collect horses. Solomon says, I'm going to collect wives, gold, and horses. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And if you don't know, a concubine is kind of like a wife, but without the status. He had 1,000 women. It's hard enough to make one woman happy. Can you imagine trying to make a thousand happy? I don't think he cared because, you know, it's just he's the king. They have to make him happy, I guess. But just like that's a lot of women. That's definitely collecting women. Gold was being shipped in from all over the place. They, they even sent him like animals for his zoo. He had a personal zoo with monkeys and lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. Right? He had that stuff. He had everything. He had to build cities because he didn't have enough space for all of the war horses he got from Egypt. When God says, don't go back to Egypt to get horses, he says, I'm going to go back to Egypt and get horses. Like, this is the wisest guy ever? When we read the history of Israel, one way that we know it's true is, is, is that Israel is in such a bad light. They make so many mistakes, and it's all recorded in the scripture. The people of Israel, if they were faking it, they wouldn't write all their mistakes in. They write all their victories. They would look like saints, like they never did anything wrong. I think you read more sins about David than you do about anybody else, yet he's the greatest king. You know why he's the greatest king? Because he always repented after his sin. He always went back to the Lord. And that comforts me. Because if I make a mistake, and you know, every once in a while, I know that God will accept me if I repent. Because look what David did. He stole someone's wife and then killed him. Okay, we didn't gloss over it. But then he came back to the Lord. And his life was horrible after. He was not a good dad. His sons were fighting, killing each other. 
not a good guy. But he came back to the Lord. Whatever David did, he came back to the Lord. And I'm so thankful for that. But because David was king, because he had, the Lord made him a promise, he said, you will always have a son on the throne. And so he had Solomon. Solomon got to sit on the throne. That's great. Uh, Solomon's son Rehoboam was the next king of Israel. Rehoboam was a mess. He lost 10 out of the 12 tribes. Uh, uh, they became the northern king of Israel, and, and Rehoboam had the southern tribe. And then almost every son after Rehoboam was evil. There were some good ones in there, Josiah, Joash, uh, Hezekiah. There were a few of them, right? Jehoshaphat. All of Jehoshaphat was kind of like hanging out with the enemy. Um, but he mostly did good things, and so there were some good sons, but most of them were evil. And when they got the Jehoiakim, and, and Je Jeconia, I know these are weird Hebrew names, it's hard to remember how to say them. When it gets to them, right before the Babylon um, invasion, they, they were so evil. God cursed Je Jeconia. Je Jeconia? I don't know how to say it. Whatever you say it. He cursed, he cursed Coney. We'll call him Coney. He cursed Coney, saying that, that, uh, that basically your blood, your sons, will never sit on the throne again. And I wonder if Satan's like, yes. God promised two things that are not compatible. One, David's line would have somebody on the throne, and then Coney's line would not. So he broke his own promise. Because then the Babylonians came in, and they took all of Judah captive. But in Matthew chapter 1, when we read that list of kings in Jesus' lineage, it gets to Joseph, who was the husband of Mary, who bore, the, who bore Jesus. So Joseph was the legal heir of the throne, but he had the curse in his blood. But Jesus was not blood-related to Joseph, just to Mary. And if we read later on in Luke in chapter 3, we see through Mary's line that, that uh, Jesus is also a son of David, So uh, through Nathan's line. And so Jesus fulfills both promises. He gets to sit on the throne as a son of David, and the curse does not... Uh, does not factor him in because he's not, he's not blood-related. I kind of got away from it, from, from where I was going. Joseph, the house of David. I was just talking about David. Okay, let's keep going. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Can you imagine being in your house and an angel shows up? Right? And this is actually the first time I, I read that the angel comes in and says, Rejoice. Without, what do angels usually say when they come to talk to somebody, right? They say, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Be not afraid. Stop screaming, right? Because angels are scary looking. They have six wings and eyes all over their bodies and stuff, and, and, and they, they show up, and everyone's always afraid. If they look like naked babies with harps, they'd have to come and say, stop laughing. I have an important message from the Lord. But here, rejoice. That's good news. But it's still be kind of scary. Mary's sitting there. I don't know what she's doing. Watching TV or something. And the angel shows up. Uh, and she's just waiting. And, and the angel shows up and says, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. How would you like that to be said to you? How would you like an angel come say, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you? How cool is that? What was her life like? That she was highly favored by the Lord. What was she doing all the time? Was she studying the scriptures? I mean, women, they learned how to read at that time, only in Israel, not the other countries. So they could study scriptures, but they weren't like super well educated. Just good enough to teach their kids before they went to school. What was she doing? Was she always on her knees in prayer? The Bible doesn't say. I'm just speculating. Like, what is it that her life was like that caused God to send angels say, you are highly favored by the Lord? How cool is that? How proud must this Joseph be? Because I don't know if he got a say in who was, who was marrying either. And it says, blessed are you among women. That, 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 that is awesome to hear. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. First it's like, who are you? How'd you get into my house? And then she's, oh, it's an angel from the Lord. What does this mean? Why has he chosen me? Because most people, especially the righteous people, they just want to live a simple, humble life, right? 
No, for real. So have you guys ever seen like Lord of the Rings or the, or, or the Hobbit? The Hobbits are not in the mood for adventure, are they? They just kind of want a simple, quiet life. And, and I imagine she's like that. You know, I'm not saying that Mary was a Hobbit. I haven't checked her feet or anything. But, she, but she's just like, what's going on? It troubles her that this angel's coming to her house and telling her this. Then the angel says, do not be afraid. There it is. Do not be afraid. He starts with rejoice, and he has to get around to do not be afraid, because she was afraid. Uh, for you have found favor with God. Have you found favor with God? How do you know? The answer, by the way, is yes. Yes, you have found favor with God. You know how you know? Because he died on the cross for you. He loves you because he died on the cross for you. You have his favor. You have his attention. You don't have to try and get it. You don't have to work hard to try to do things so that God will go, oh, he's a nice guy. She's a good person. He already loves you. He already notices you. It doesn't matter what your hair is doing that day. He loves you anyway because he made you. And a lot of people work so hard in their lives trying to earn God's favor, but they don't realize they already have it. But you do. You already have God's favor. So the question is, what are you going to do with it? Now that he's paying attention to you, what are you going to do? I had a dog once that liked to chase cars. The bigger and louder, the better. She just went after him. One time she caught one. It was driving away from us. I didn't have her on the leash. I think we were just out in the front yard. And she took off after it, and she hit the back of it so hard that she got spun around. It, the driver didn't even notice. He just kept going. But, but she hit the car as it was driving away from her. And it's like, what did you think was going to happen? The dog didn't think ahead. Just like, I'm going to chase that thing. It's moving. It's loud. We've been chasing after God. We want God to notice us. Okay? God's noticed you. Now what? What's the plan? Have you noticed in our worship songs, when we get God's attention, you know what we do? We praise him. We tell God how good he is. Not trying to flatter him, not trying to butter him up so we can ask him for something later. But we tell him how good he is because he's good. We tell him how we need him because we need him. Sometimes it's just nice to come in God's presence and just be there. Have you guys ever visited your parents after your parents got old? Okay, sometimes they want stuff from you, right? Can you fix this thing? The sink's leaking, whatever. But honestly, sometimes they just like having you there. Just having a seat. And just being in their presence, talking to them and spending time with them. Think that's what God wants? He doesn't need us to fix anything for him. He doesn't need us to work for him. Of course, we want to work for him, and he wants us to do things for him, not because we're trying to earn his favor, but because we already have it. He just wants us to be with him. Do you spend time with the Lord like that, where you're just with him? You ever wonder, how, how do I spend time with the Lord? What do I do to spend time with the Lord? Read his word. Just read it. You don't have to study. I mean, studying is good, and I say you should study the word, but sometimes just get it out and just read it. Don't try to get anything from it. Just read it. And let the Lord do his thing. The Lord will speak to your heart, but you're not there for you. You're there for him. You're worshiping him by studying his word, by, sorry, by reading his word and just being in his presence. And as he speaks to your heart, Cherish what he says to you. And the more you read his word, the more you're going to hear him. And sometimes it's just you're going to feel his love. He, he loves you. And he enjoys the time being spent with you. But that's it. It's supposed to be simple. Walking with the Lord is supposed to be simple. It's not easy. We've got so many things pulling, pulling us this way and that way, trying to, trying to get us to do different things other than just sit and read his word. But remember Mary and Martha? What was Martha doing? Working in the kitchen. What was Mary doing? She was sitting at the feet of the Lord and listening to what he was saying. Martha's like, tell her to help me. He's like, no, she's chosen the good thing. And how many of us are like Martha? Working, trying to get all this ministry stuff done. That's, that's, that's my default. I have to say, nope, it's time to be Mary and sit down and just read. And sometimes I have to get away, you know? Just get away by myself, and just read. Usually, my, I have to wait till all my family goes to bed. 
Then I have some quiet time. People say, you can wake up early. It's like, well, you can wake up early. I can't wake up early. That, that's a hard deal. But it's the same thing, though. Just get alone with the Lord. Spend time with him. Be blessed by him. Okay, verse 31. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. It's like you are going to get pregnant. And in that day and age, that's what every girl wanted to be was a mother. In, in fact, they wanted to be it so much that if you couldn't be a mother, you think there's something wrong with me. You think, God hates me. I'm cursed because I can't bear children. Because that was where women in that, in that society gained their value. Here, women gain their value in different ways in this society. I, I don't even think I can name them. But the question I have for you is, what gives you value, whether you're a girl or a guy? Okay, guys usually give value in their work. I'm, you know, do, I do this for a living. I'm a mechanic. I'm a pastor. I'm whatever. That's where my value is. That's my identity. That's not how God sees you. That's how we see each other, though, right? You're like, oh, you're a mechanic? I got a problem with my car. Can you, can you come take a look at this? Because that's where I ascribe your value is, is, is you being able to do something for me. What can we do for God that is valuable? Nothing. He doesn't need us. Not a single one of us. He chooses us because he loves us. Okay, my oldest son's nine, and he's just starting to be useful around the house. It's, he's just starting to be, get in a place where I can give him a job, and he can do it without me having to help him do it, and he can get it done in a reasonable amount of time. Just starting. And I got a seven-year-old, a four-year-old, and a well, ten-month-old. He's too young to do anything, Right? But, but like the four-year-old, if I give him a job, he will work hard at it. His heart's there, but it'll take so long to get it done that I have to help him with it in order to get it done, or it's just not going to get done in any timely manner. You know, it's just, it's just the way it is. And I, I, I look at God sometimes, and I'm working hard for him. My heart's there, but I'm like, God, did, would it be faster if you did this? But even, even though that's the case, I always give my four-year-old jobs. I love his help. I want him to learn to be a good, strong helper. And he loves doing it. It makes him feel part of the family. And I love to help the Lord, even if he could do it better, faster, without me. And sometimes I'm like, well, if you can do it better, then go ahead and do it, because I'm having a hard time. But he wants me to do it because I can learn how to work better and harder and, and, and just be better at it. And then it's something that we're doing together. God wants us to be involved, just like we want our kids to be involved in the stuff that we do. So women found their value in being a mother, and hopefully you will find your value in, in belonging to Jesus. Verse 32, he will be great, and he will be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. There's that promise. He's going to have the throne. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And it's not just like hyperbole. He means it. He will rule forever and his rule will never end. I mean, what good news is that? She is going to give birth to the king. How cool is that? And of course, that's why she's honored. That's why she's favored. She is the vessel that God is going to use to bring his son into the world. How amazing. How scared would you be if that was you right now? Like, not only do you have all the normal stuff, am I going to be a good mom? Am I going to be a good mom to the Son of God? And she's, and, and she's confused, of course. She doesn't get it. And Mary said to the angel, verse 34, How can this be since I, I do not know a man? It's like, I'm not married yet. I'm still a virgin. How can I be pregnant? I don't get it. Other people ask, how can this be? And they get reprimanded, not Mary. Because she believes it. She just doesn't get it. And if God tells you to do something and you don't get it, it's okay to ask, how is this going to happen? I don't get it. But your heart's got to be, okay, I believe you first. I just like to know. I'm curious. He'll answer all the questions then. 
or something. So he'll just say, trust me, and then you'll have to figure that you'll have to trust them, and then he'll explain later. Then the angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of his highest will overshadow you. Therefore also, that the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived the son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who is called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. So she's saying, how can this be? I, I can't be pregnant. I've never, I, I, I never, I'm still a virgin. I never got married. Not yet anyway. And, and he said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and will put the baby inside. And as a sign that this is true, go see your, your cousin Elizabeth. In her old age, she was too old to bear children, but now she is six months pregnant. And she will bear a child. And that's going to be your proof. How cool is that? And then I love verse 37. For with God, nothing will be impossible. You ever see, see stuff going on in your life like, there's no way I can get through this. It's impossible. There's no way that this trial will pass and I will survive. It's impossible. God, nothing's impossible. He will carry you through. And then, like, we go on to Mary visiting Elizabeth. I, I kind of feel like there should be, like, an extra verse in there where Mary goes, Gabriel, while you're here, would you mind going and talk to my mom? She's right next door. Could you let her know that this is happening? Because she's going to have some questions and I'm not going to have any answers. Right, you've already made the journey. Five more minutes is not going to put you back any. Because, like, how hard is that going to be? She's going to be pregnant and still a virgin. People are going to be like, you're not a virgin. No way. Impossible. For God, it's possible. They're like, yeah, right. They're not going to believe her. For however long it's going to be, probably in her whole life, people are going to think, you did something wrong. You messed around. Maybe it was with Joseph. Maybe it was with somebody else. But you messed around. And you got pregnant. And so that kid shouldn't be here. But he should, of course, obviously. Sometimes we're going to go through life where we know we are doing the right thing. But everybody else is going to look down on us and say, no, that's not right. Like, but I know this is right. This is what the Bible says to do. And, and, and the world's going to go, no, nope. you have to be more inclusive. You have to bow down to their wishes because of whatever they are. You have to do things that way. And you're like, no, this is the right way. This is what the Bible says. And the world is going to say it's wrong. And we just need to stick to what the Bible says. Just stick to it. We're not out there picking fights. We're not out there trying to bring other people down. What does God say to you? He says to love people. Well, they're the enemy. Well, God says love the enemy. But we don't have to compromise and do whatever they say to do. You know you're on the right track, so keep walking on that track no matter what the world says. The world's going to oppose you. You know why? Because the world opposed Jesus. The world hated him. The world killed him. They're going to want to do the same thing to you unless you bow down and do whatever they say. But God says, don't do that. And whose job is it to protect you, yours or his? It's his job. So let him do the hard stuff. And you just do the simple thing of following his word. So she goes to visit her cousin. Now Mary arose in the days and went to the hill country with haste to the city of Judah, to a city of Judah, and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe, that's John the Baptist inside of Elizabeth, leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women. And she's like, that's what the angel said. And blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped to my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. Elizabeth praises Mary because she's blessed and she believed the angel. 
And John the Baptist verified it. It's like, yes, this is, this is the Lord. Which doesn't make you wonder, like later on, after John the Baptist was born and Jesus was born, and 30 years later when John the Baptist was thrown in jail, he sends his disciples to Jesus and says, hey, are, are you the one that's coming or is there another? I mean, here he said, behold the Lamb of God, this is the guy. And now he's like, are you the guy? What's going on here? And the reason is, is because John the Baptist thought, like every other Jew thought, that the Messiah was going to come and throw off the Romans and lead a political and military campaign to make the Jews prominent people on the earth and everybody else uh, less than them, that they would all come to Jerusalem to worship God, just like the Old Testament says in, in the Minor Prophets and in the Major Prophets. It, it talks about the millennial reign, but it doesn't say millennial reign. And so they think that's what the Messiah is coming to do. And, and the answer is yes, he's coming to do that, just not this time. He's doing that next time. This time he's coming to die for your sins. But they didn't understand that. And you know why they didn't understand that? Because it hadn't happened yet. While it was happening, nobody understood it. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, everybody else in the world thought that he lost. Even the devil thinks that he lost. Some people say, oh, the devil was trying to get Jesus down off the cross. I think the devil was putting Jesus on the cross. Otherwise, he wouldn't have entered Judas to betray Jesus to put him up there in the first place. The devil's like, yes, I'm killing the Son of God. And then he gets up again the third day, and the devil's like, oh, no. What's going on now? This is trouble. You know, because the devil knows Scripture, but he doesn't know the future. Even though Jesus said, I'm going to rise in three days, everyone's like, yeah, right, I don't know what you're talking about. No one's ever done that before. What would that do? That doesn't make any sense. So they just went on, the disciples just went on arguing about who is the greatest. They, didn't, they weren't listening to what Jesus was saying. They didn't get it anyway. Disciples thought Jesus, that they had lost, so they were flee. They'd run out. John was the only one witnessing the cross. The women were there because they were just... They, they, they weren't worried about their own safety. They, they were just women. And, I mean, it's sad to say, but in that society, they didn't really pay a whole lot of attention to the women. So the women could go wherever they wanted to, and no one was paying attention to them. Um, and so, so, so they were able to, they, but they, everybody thought that they lost. Jesus was the only one who knew that he won. The only one. It wasn't until after he rose again, the Holy Spirit comes upon all of us, they were like, oh yeah, now we get it. Now we know why you had to go to the cross. But before then, nobody knew. So John was so confused. What are you doing, Jesus? Why are you not raising up an army and throwing the Romans off? Or is there somebody? And he's, he wasn't going to say, Jesus, you're doing it wrong. He's just like, I, I thought I knew the plan, but I guess I don't know the plan. Is somebody else coming? And Jesus responds to him. It's like, hey, look what's going on. I'm healing people. I'm making them better. Sometimes we expect Jesus to do something that he's not planning to do in our lives, at least not yet. Jesus, make this thing go away and make that problem go away and make me feel like uh, I can lift a heavy stone and throw it across the ocean. Or, or like we ask Jesus for all of these things that we want to do and want to see, the things that we imagine ourselves. And Jesus is like, I just want to kind of heal you a little bit. You've been hurt for so long. And you are asking me out of your anger to do something when I just want to do some healing on your heart. I just want to make it so you can love people again. And that is a miracle in itself because some people are so hurt. They respond with such hatred that love is squeezed out of their heart and they've got no room to love anyone else. And Jesus says to love everyone else. How do you know when Jesus is working on your heart, when you can love your enemy. Everyone can love a friend, right? Someone brings you a pizza. Man, I love you. Thanks for the pizza. Easy. Someone takes your pizza. I love you. I want my pizza back, though. You know, it's just like, it's hard to love when people are mean to you. When you can love those people. That's how you know Jesus has worked on your heart. And how are you going to know if that bad stuff never happens to you? How are you going to know that you have the love of Jesus if nothing hard or bad happens in your life? It's going to happen. It's got to happen. 
so that Jesus' love can shine through. And all the people who are, who are trying to figure out if Jesus is real, when they see you love someone who doesn't deserve your love, they're like, dude, why are you loving that person for? That person hates you. Like, yeah, but God loves them. And if God loves them, I figure I should love them because I, I want God to love me too. And he does. It's going to speak more to them than the entire Bible. Because they're not going to read it anyway, right? You've heard it said that the only Bible some people read is you. You like people know you're a Christian and they're like, they're, they're going to they're gonna make judgments on God depending on your character. That's a lot of pressure, isn't it? You know, like, I got to be perfect now because people are going to believe in God or not believe in God because of how I act. Just talk to them. When you mess up, and you mess up, and, when, and they'll see it because they're watching. They're like, hey, I messed up. But you know what? My God is a loving God. And I can go and ask for forgiveness and he forgives me. I, I can repent from my sins and say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do it, or I did mean to do it, but now I know it's wrong. I need to stop it. And if you're open with them in that, they will start to get their eyes off of you and on to Jesus. They have to see it. They have to see you be open and humble in order to see it, because if you look like you got all the answers, what does that tell them? That tells them, well, I don't know anything. I'm never going to know anything. You are, you are perfect. You're holy. You're great. I'm a sinner, so I can never be like you. They have to see your flaws. They have to see your flaws so that they can realize, man, I'm just like you, but God loves you. Why? Maybe God loves me too. Why do you think every hero in the Bible shows their flaws? Let's go through them real quick. Abraham, flaws? Yeah. He went, he went to a foreign country, took his wife, first time she was 75, second time she was 99 and pregnant, and said, you're so beautiful, they're going to kill me to marry you, so don't tell them you're my wife, tell them you're my sister. What woman wants her husband to say, don't tell them you're my wife, tell them you're my sister, Right? Sarah says, oh, I'm never going to have a child. You should have a child with my servant, and I'll just pretend it's mine. And Abraham goes, okay. Like, come on, right? Isaac, playing favorites with his kids. Jacob, stealing his birthright, deceiving his father. Just basically deceiving everywhere. His kids, killing a whole town because one guy raped their sister. That's 34, I think, if you want. Uh, Judah not giving his, his, uh, his third son to this wife when the first two died. I think maybe he's like, maybe she cooks bad stuff. I don't know. Uh, but they were evil, so God kills them. And so, so she dresses up as a prostitute, and then he goes into her to have the next son in the line of Jesus. And it's kind of like, come on, Judah, don't do that with prostitutes. That's not a good job. That's not a good idea. And it was his idea to sell sell uh, Joseph into slavery in the first place. Okay? Then we go, like, to Moses. Moses kills the Egyptians. Like, I'm going to deliver the people of God by killing people. And it's just like, come on, that's not a good idea. And when God says, I'm going to use you, he says, no, send somebody else. So much that it angered God that God says, fine, I'll send Aaron with you. It was supposed to be Moses. By himself the whole time, Moses refused God. Now, how many of you are brave enough to do that, right? Or foolish enough? We already talked about David's sins. We already talked about Solomon's sins. And it's just like the heroes of the Bible are so flawed. And if you read ancient texts, if anybody's like, that, that, that's what, you're not going to find it anywhere else. The, pe the people that they say, oh, these are heroes, they're going to be perfect in their eyes, right? They're going to be like Superman. What's Superman's weakness? Kryptonite. Some green rock that comes from his own planet. If it comes from his planet, why is it weak in him? I don't get that. But they have to make something up to make him weak because he's too strong. Because he's not real. The real people have flaws. Because you and I have flaws. And we look at these people and like God still loved them. They did horrible things. God still loved them. Maybe God will still love me. And if people don't see that in your life, they're not going to want to come to God. 
Be honest. Be real. Show them your hurt and your pain and your scars because then you can follow it with, but God forgave me. And lead these people to Christ. After Mary spent time with Elizabeth, she, she, she's saying, this is verse uh, 46, and Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant and behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in, the remembrance, in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her, her house. And we'll get, well, we won't get to it, but Pastor Sam will get to the, the Christmas story in, in, in about a week or so. But after reading that song that she wrote for, for God, they're like, okay, I kind of see why God chose her. She was humble. She understood who God was, that he loved to pick up the lowly. That he loved the people who were down and out. That he loved the people who thought that they themselves were worthless. Because in God's eyes, they were worth a whole lot. And now, we have the whole world in front of us. Of people who think they're worthless. Maybe that was you. Maybe you think you've been worthless. What's God going to do with me? What am I going to do with me? I can't even take care of myself. Can't do anything. You guys like job hunting? I hate job hunting. Right? You got to convince everybody else that you're worth a lot of money so you can get a good job that pays a lot of money. But you're like, I don't believe this stuff. I don't think I'm worth this much money, but I want to say I am, so I get it. So many people out there think they're worthless. And now with social media, it's even worse because they see how well everybody else is doing, but everybody else is just pretending. I'm doing great. Look at this picture of this food I'm getting or how good I look today or whatever. And it's all doctored and photoshopped because they want to look good. You know why they want to look good? Because they don't feel good. They don't feel good about themselves. They don't feel good about what they've been doing. They don't feel good about their relationship with God because maybe they don't have one. Maybe they're searching for God. Maybe they don't even know where to start looking. I want to know what the truth is. I want to find purpose for my life, but I don't know what it is. They think they're worthless. God loves those people. Those are the people he's come to call, but they don't listen to him because God doesn't speak like a man speaks. But he speaks to you through his word. And he's asking you, will you go speak to these people for me? I don't have to tell you who they are. I bet God is putting a name in your heart right now of somebody who needs to know about his love. And you don't have to go and do a Bible study. You don't have to go with prepared sermon or a tract saying, you need to read this and give your life to the Lord. Just start it with a hug. These people need help. I think of when Jesus is healing lepers. You know, whenever he healed a leper, he touched them? He touched the lepers. Because they have not been touched since they ever, whenever they contracted leprosy. They weren't allowed to be touched. No one would touch them. No one would touch them. And Jesus touches them. They were afraid that when they were touched, the leprosy would go on to, to, to the clean person. But Jesus put his cleanness on the leper. Who are you going to touch? Okay, that sounds weird. Who are you going to help and save because you have the cleansing power of Jesus. They need help. They need the way. And you have it. You have it in the word in front of you. You have it in your minds. You have it in your hearts. I know this because God says he puts it in your minds and hides it in your heart. God has already done that work. All you got to do is go be with people. Listen to their story. 
Watch them cry. Cry with them. And tell them, there's a better way. When Jesus went to the tomb of Lazarus, he was going to raise him from the dead, but he first wept with them. Right? Shortest verse in the Bible, John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. You ask a kid, you know any verse in the Bible? What's one verse in the Bible you know? Jesus wept. Okay, great. You know another one? Because it's so short. They say it because it's so short, but it's so profound. Jesus wept with them. So be with people. Sit with them. As a pastor, sometimes I go to, go to hospital visits. Visit people who are sick or dying. And, and, and they don't want, like, big, long sermons. I mean, I got a bunch of sermons. That's not what they want to hear. They just want me to sit and be there with them. Pray with them. Talk to God with them. Hear what they have to say. And sometimes just sit there and not leave. And, like, that's it. I don't even have to be smart. I could just sit there. This world is full of hurt and dying people. There aren't enough pastors to go around. That's why God's called on you. And you're like, I can't do it. I'm broken. Good God loves to use broken people. I'm hurt too. God loves to use the hurt to heal the hurt. And what we need to do is get the focus off of ourselves and put it on to somebody else. How can I help this person grow closer to the Lord? And when you find yourself working for the Lord, you'll see that your problems, they're not as big. All of a sudden, there's a solution for it. All of a sudden, somebody else is coming in and helping you with yours. And you're like, no, no, I don't need help. Let's help this person together. God's got you taken care of. But when you're focused on your problem, you're telling God, no, no, I got to deal with this. I got to figure this out, God. You leave me alone so I can figure out what I'm going to do here. And then when I figure out what I need from you, then I'll ask you for it. Or really, then I'll tell you what to do, God, to fix my problem. But just be broken in front of them. It's okay to tell God, I don't know what to say. I've come to you in this place of prayer, and I don't even know what to pray. I don't know. I don't get it. I'm lost. Because the Bible says when you don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit will pray for you. It's in Romans 8, 38 or something like that. Trust him. He will do it. Let's pray. My Lord Jesus, you are an amazing God. Thank you so much for, visit, for sending Gabriel to visit Mary. Thank you so much for choosing her to, to bring forth your Messiah. Thank you for sending the Christ that I could be saved. My Lord Jesus, I don't deserve any of this. If I look at what I've done and what I've said and what I thought, I know I deserve to be rotting in hell, an eternity away from you. But because of your great love, you have come and rescued me. I pray, Lord, that there are others here that you would rescue. And if there's anyone in this room or watching online who needs Jesus, Raise your hand. Maybe this is the first time you've realized you needed him so much. You've heard his name. You've been to church. But you've never quite become a Christian. It's just something you did, not something you were. If that's you and you realize for the first time that you are a sinner deserving death, but Jesus died on the cross to save you, raise your hand so I can pray with you and welcome you into the kingdom. And maybe you don't want to hear, maybe you're not in this room, so, you, so I can't see you anyway. Pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I am a sinner. I know I deserve to die for my sins, Jesus, but you died for me. The cross you died on, that was my cross. I deserve to be up there, but you didn't. You were perfect. But then, Lord Jesus, after you died, you rose again. You ask me if I will be yours, Lord Jesus. I'm saying yes, yes, please. Let me be your child. Save me. Please be my God. I give you my life now and forever. That I may be wherever you are. 
love you, Jesus. I pray this in your precious and holy name. Amen.